Finally, a full review of this, the Subaru Solterra electric car. But is it any good? Well, in this video, I'm gonna do my best to showcase this car's features and look at what this car can and cannot do. I'm gonna do my best to make this sensible car into an entertaining video. You will ultimately be Caesar. You'll be the judge. Please upvote or downvote as you see fit. Let's crack into it, starting with the price and the range. Unlike other car reviewers, as always, I tell you the price and the range of the car right here at the start of the video to maximize your time. Once I've said it, you can rush off and watch Shortland Street. See, better living, everyone. Okay, so like channel surfing in New Zealand in the 1980s, you've got basically only two choices. You've got this one, the drum and bass model, which is $80,000. Then, of course, you've got the next level up, the touring version, which is $85,000. Now, both cars have a range of 485 Ks per charge. Asterisk. Yes. There is, there is a big asterisk coming. I'll get to that later in the video. Both cars are also all-wheel drive. Yep, they've got two motors, one at the front, one at the back. Total power of 160 kilowatts driving this vehicle and 337 Isaacs. Yep, that's a lot of apples. What it means is that this car can do zero to 100 in 6.9 seconds, which is fairly respectable. It kind of feels like you're driving, say, a two liter turbo, but with this, you don't have any turbo lag or no rumble. And both cars have a 71.4 kilowatt hour battery pack slapped underneath the vehicle. Vehicle. Now, many of you in the comments will be pointing out, hey, Gav, isn't this just that Toyota BZ4X WD40 R2D2 in drag? And well, yeah, it is basically. Underneath, it is a Toyota, but there are some differences between the two cars. This is basically a badge engineered version, and badge engineering has been going on for 100 years, so it's nothing too scary. Don't worry too much about that. In fact, Subaru, they've badge engineered their own cars. They've sold their own models in the past as Chevrolets in some markets, and as Isuzu's, and even as Saab's. So don't get hung up on the badge engineering. As for which version you should buy, this, the Subaru version or the Toyota version, well, you could run off and buy the Toyota version, which is $7,000 cheaper, which sounds pretty good, but it is slower than this, and it's in front wheel drive, whereas this, well, this is all wheel drive in both models. And technically, according to Subaru, you can take this off-roading. Yes, what makes it off-roady is that it has this much more ground clearance than the Toyota version. And I've spoken to big, tough off-roady people, and they tell me they all wish that they had just this much more. Let's talk exterior design now, and I don't quite know what to make of it. I don't dislike it, but I'm not sure if I love it. I'm not sure I'm sold on that big grill. It's sort of reminiscent of the Ford Mustang Mark E. Overall, it's all right. But again, you shouldn't probably take my thoughts on design too seriously because this is coming from a person who willingly purchased two Lada Nevas and an Austin Allegro. As for those plastic panels, I know the idea is to make the car look tough, to give the impression that, hey, this is actually a real capable off-roader, it's rugged, it's not just a city car, but I'm not sure I'm buying it. Putting plastic rugged panels on the side is kind of like putting me in tough work boots. It's not fooling anyone. I still end up looking like the love child of Barry Crump and Katie Lang. As for that interior, it's probably perfect that it's now started raining because the interior is grey. We've got grey carpets, grey dash, grey interior, grey seats. It's very grey. If you added an in-car shower, it would be like grey mouth in winter. It's grey. If you can get past this really busy instrument cluster, then you'll find the instrument cluster is at just the right height that you don't need a heads-up display. But also, you're looking over the steering wheel at the cluster, which is kind of reminiscent of the Peugeot e-partner. And in that car, just like this, I get the feeling I'm not driving a car, I'm kind of playing a computer game, which is fun because I'm basically 12 mentally. And as the sun has now magically come out, let's talk about comfort, and no one quite does comfort like the Japanese. The seats are delightfully comfortable. The carpets are thick and padded. The interior, the fabrics, I mean, look at that, they even put fabric on the dashboard. I love it. As for those seats on this, the base model, the driver's seat is fully adjustable electronically, plus it has in and out lumbar support, that's really nice, but the passenger side is manually operated only. Now you might think that that's a bad thing, having manually adjusted passenger seats, but uh, it's worth the trade-off because in this, the base model, you get fabric seats, whereas in the top spec one, you get fake leather, vinyl. So I, if I were you, I'd probably go with the base spec one because I like fabric seats. Anyone who's driven with me knows that I prefer touching cloth. The seat height is also great in this car if you have limited mobility or if you're like me, you're just a thousand years old because at its lowest setting, the lip of the front seat is still 68 centimeters off the ground. That makes getting in and out really, really easy. As for interior space, there's heaps of it. Like even though this is an electric car in which you can tell the battery does eat into the floor space slightly because the battery's underneath the car, you don't notice too much because your legs are extended outwards more 
rather than sit up and big. And you've also got heaps of headroom. Like I'm five foot 10 and there is masses of room here. I reckon people six feet tall could effortlessly fit into this car. Same goes in the back. Look how much leg room there is. Look how much headroom there is. And backseat passengers, I think again, can be at least six feet tall and still ride in comfort in this car. Plus, there's a little party trick in the back there. Check out the back seats, they recline. Yes, sure, it may recline about as much as Ryanair, but unlike Ryanair, this is comfortable. Let's talk storage though, because that's important and I fear I may disappoint you with this car. If you pop the bonnet, hoping to find that there may be a fartment or front compartment, nope, there is nothing but a sea of electric vehicle componentry under there, which for some reason, they haven't installed under the car discreetly they've taken up all that front space that is unfortunate and moving back into the cockpit you might be hoping that maybe you can put all your excess potatoes in the glove box well not so fast believe it or not this car is one of the first I've driven in a long time that does not have a glove box there is no glove box at all don't worry though because there is a boot which is automatically openable using the buttons on the remote control and there is heaps of room in there yes there is 441 liters which is quite a decent amount of room that's in the touring version the top spec one because right there is where a subwoofer goes in the top spec one which has the 10 speaker Harman Kardon sound system this one does not however it means you do get a little bit more storage space if you need more though you can drop those seats down it gives you a lot more room actually enough room to lie down and fully so yeah you can take this car camping that's pretty cool and you see that parcel shelf there that kind of gets in the way don't worry one thing I love about this car is that it is stowable yeah the designers have actually thought about it by lifting up that floor you can fold it in there stow it in there and look at that flat floor Honestly, more car makers should do that. It's logical, but it's still such a rare thing. It's like finding another Kiwi in Bali who hasn't just had a fresh tattoo done. Let's move on to gadgetry now. And this car has a reasonable amount of gadgetry. It has seated heats in both the driver's seat and the passenger seat, and seated heats in the back as well. Yep, back seat passengers have controls there. It also has a display mirror that if you find your rear seat passengers far too ugly to look at, simply flipping this, look at that, turns it into a display. That is sweet. There's also quite a lot going on information wise. Like, yeah, you've got the central display here, which has quite a good map system built in, to be honest. I'm really impressed. Look at how little lag there is. You zoom in, you zoom out, it's instant. And it's got that big blue circle there as well to show you how far you can go with the remaining range left on your car. The instrument cluster is also kind of full of information, maybe a little bit too much. It could get a bit confusing. You have to take your eyes off the road quite a long time to figure out what's going on. Also, I'm not quite sure I'm keen on that giant green ready symbol. Like, yes, of course the car's ready. I'm driving it. So yeah, you might want to tape over that with some insulation tape. Back onto displays so though, this car also has a fairly decent bird's eye view camera system for reversing and on the subject of connectivity well this base model does not have wireless phone charging although both models come with fruity carplay and robotic order yeah you've got your android and apple connectivity sorted and in both models it is wireless so i suppose subaru giveth and both taketh away kind of godlike one thing this drum and bass model doesn't have though that the touring model has is a sunroof which means that when it gets a little overcast like now it makes this gray interior even grayer and right now it is grayer than Captain Picard's favorite tea. Overall though, this car's really easy to operate and it's no secret that it is targeted at the older driver. Me, basically. And I'm not saying I'm really old, but I did when I was a kid. I used emojis, but back in those days it was called hieroglyphics. I mean, basically this is a car designed for those who are just venturing into the electric vehicle sphere that maybe haven't had one before and are a little bit freaked out by how new and weird they may be. This proves that they are not weird. They're pretty easy to operate. All the buttons are where you'd think it would be. All the controls are where you'd think they'd be. It's, it's, it's really easy to operate. No learnings required. There's no culture shock when you get behind the wheel of this. Anyone can drive this car. But what's it like on a road trip, you might ask? How does it handle the highways? How does it handle the corners? And how long does it take to recharge? Oh, and more importantly, can it go off-roading? Well, let's hit the highway and let's find out. Good morning, and it's time for that aforementioned road trip. We are going from here in Tekawiti all the way to Opotiki, that's right across the North Island. A distance of 278 kilometers, it's gonna take three and a half, four hours, but it's probably gonna feel longer because there's no direct route to get from the west to the east. It's all highways and twisty roads. So that four hours is gonna feel more like 10, more like watching Lord of the Rings, you know, all three movies back to back, which I don't know. I don't know if I'm gonna alienate just about every listener here or every viewer, but I'm not a Lord of the Rings fan. I'm one of three Kiwis who just never got it. Like, I tried watching it, but it's, it's three three-hour movies about walking to a mountain. 
All right, now that I've lost all the viewers, let's crack into it. This road trip should be a good test of that claimed 485 Ks per charge. Asterisk. Yeah, we'll get to that. But first, when we get into the 100 K zone, I want to test the zero to 100 time. Finally, let's see if that 6.9 seconds is accurate. All right, we're on the open road. Let's do the zero to 100 time when we have a nice empty section. Three, two, one. So it's a little sluggish in that first half second when it gets off the mark, but then, Oh, that's very good. That's really good. So if, I'm not, not an engineologist, but if I were to compare this to a combustion engine, like I said earlier, it's kind of like a, a two liter four cylinder turbocharged engine, or maybe like a three liter six cylinder, but without that rumble and roar of a combustion engine. Plus, this is clean. Yes, I've been running this thing off Ecotricity Electricity, and Ecotricity, if you don't know, is New Zealand's only certified climate positive electricity provider. So if you're gonna get an electric car, or if you just wanna undo the damage of general living day-to-day -day life, putting carbon into the atmosphere, sign up at ecotricity.co.nz. You can live your life climate positive. Yes, it's better than carbon neutral. It's electricity that actually helps to turn back the clock on climate change. It sounds too good to be true, but it's all certified by Toitu, and that's not an easy certification to get. So sign up at ecotricity.co.nz. Leave the planet in a better place for your kids and grandkids. But now let's crack into a road trip. And normally, if this was the motorway, I'd turn on the adaptive cruise, because this car has adaptive cruise control, which takes care of all your braking and your steering and accelerating. You just have to keep your hands on the wheel, but it does all the work for you. Uh, and there's some footage I've taken earlier of me on the motorway, and it works a treat. It brings you to a stop nicely. It accelerates again nicely. It makes sitting in traffic an absolute breeze. There is a rattle somewhere on the dashboard though, which I'm quite, quite surprised from such a brand new Subaru Toyota car to actually have rattling interior panels. Hopefully that's just, I got an unlucky one. Yeah, it's somewhere over there and I can't quite identify where it is. And if you're anything like me, a squeaking window wiper or a rattle in the dashboard will drive you freaking mad. Right now that I'm gonna turn on the heated steering wheel. I'm going to turn on the heated seats just to low. The temperature inside is set just right. I'm gonna settle in for a nice road trip because soon we will have some corners. And we're on some corners at last and the car handles really quite well, deceptively well. It's one of those cars that on the highways, it feels kind of like a Camry, you know, that sort of Camry level of big car comfort. But here on the corners, it, it's surprisingly nimble. There's no body roll, put that down to the suspension. The grip's great, put that down to the tires. But also, it doesn't want to let go. Part of the reason for that is it's low center of gravity. And it's the, the biggest part of its bulk is that battery pack. And that's slammed right down low underneath the car, which means that it just, I mean, you can see the car in front of me is lurching around the corner. Whereas this, put my foot down and wow, look at it go. I mean, it's not, it's not a slot car, obviously. There are cars I've driven that handle much better than this, but for a family car, look at it go. That is remarkable. The other cars are straining, these combustion cars in front of me with their higher centers of gravity and their really lackluster tires, I can see aren't that wide. They're struggling a bit, but not this. From such a comfortable family car, it's really surprising. Welcome to Opotiki. Yes, we've finally made it. It has been a long morning of driving. Okay, now let's talk range. We left for the full charge. The car can supposedly do 485 Ks per charge. The distance is 278 Ks. We should have more than 200 Ks on the gasometer left in the tank, but no, we have 106 Ks left. And the reason for that, well, there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, I've been driving fairly spiritedly, so my efficiency's not been very good. I've got 6.2 kilometers per kilowatt hour, that's the weird metric the Japanese use, which works out to be just over 16 units of electricity, 16 kilowatt hours per 100K. Now that's not brilliant, to be honest. The other reason is, this car's not being honest with how far it can go per charge. Thing is, that 485 Ks per charge, that's based on the NEDC cycle. That's a metric to measure range that's just not used very much. What it should have used is the WLTP cycle. That's what most car makers advertise. And WLTP range of this car, well, it's 414 Ks per charge. That's quite a difference. And keep in mind, in New Zealand conditions, take 15% off the WLTP range, and that's your real world New Zealand range. Bottom line is, you're more likely to get 380-ish Ks per charge in normal driving in this car. All right, so now I'm gonna go find the charger and plug it in because then we have a little adventure to do. 
And the car's been charging for about 45 minutes now and it's got from 27% to 80% charge in that time. That's a typical amount you'd charge on a road trip. So factor that in. If you're going long distance, you could be looking at about 45 minutes on average to stop and recharge every, say, 350 kilometers. Okay, now, the charging's done. The car's now at 80%. What I want to do is see if that badge there is actually the real deal. Let's go find out. And this is it. Welcome to the Ecotricity Specialized Test Road of Grip, Efficiency and Nimbleness, which has an unfortunate abbreviation, but regardless, this should be a good test of the Subaru Solterra's off-road ability. Now, to be fair, Subaru never marketed this as being like a Toyota Land Cruiser killer, a rugged off-roader, but they have marketed it as having moderate off-road ability. You know, their B-roll footage shows it going on dirt tracks and stuff, so you could use this to go to the beach, to go fishing, or go camping, you know, you know the drill. But in order to figure out if it can get up that hill or not, we need a test car. And this is the test car in mind. This is a first-generation Nissan Leaf, famed for its off-roading ability. <clears throat> so we're gonna put this up there and see if it goes. My driver is gonna be Greg. Are you ready, Greg? Ready. Yeah, okay. <laughs> when you're ready. So that's it. Okay, we've got our control mark. You almost made it, actually. <laughs> All right, time to test the symmetrical all-wheel drive system. It will help if I put it in drive. Unlike Mr. Greg, I am not going to give a run-up. I'm going to let the car do the work. Here we go. Oh, good lord, this is steep. Oh, it doesn't look steep on camera. Crikey! Holy cow, look at it go! <laughs> that was effortless! <laughs> yes! <laughs> that was sweet! This thing can actually go off-road! That's insane! Can I do it again? <laughs> Here we go. Three, two, one. Effortless! Now that was fun, but that was not enough. I want more. So Greg's organized another test track for me here. Let me put it into X mode once again. Oh, we're in deep snow slash mud mode. Whew. Here we go. Crikey. Oh God. Oh, I didn't think it was gonna make that. Oh, <laughs> that was quite a crunch. I'm gonna check under the car. Let's hope Savara is not watching this. I can't see any damage or anything, so. That I did not expect it to do up that hill, to go up that hill, really. I thought it was gonna to have to, you thought you were gonna to have to rescue me with a tractor, didn't you? I had the tractor ready to go. <laughs> so there you go, I, I'm impressed, Greg's impressed, and he does actual, he's an actual off-roadologist. Lost for words, really lost for words. I mean, you saw it on camera, I'm amazed, and with that, Let's do the spud score. Starting with performance, and I'm giving it seven spuds as it's zero to 100 time is above average. Handling is next, and again, seven spuds. It's low center of gravity, outshines most combustion cars. As for comfort, again, it gets seven potatoes because it's a really decent combo of power, cornering, and ride quality intelligently combined into one car. As for efficiency, I'm giving it four tubers as it's not the greatest, and its range meter is far too conservative. Gadgetry is next, and it gets six metrics spuds. It's got just about everything and I would give it more if only it had wireless phone charging or a vehicle to load adapter. What about value? Well it's a tricky one. I'm gonna give it five spuds because while it's good it's not the cheapest EV out there today. As for charging I'm giving it six out of ten because a 20 to 80 percent rapid charge at a full speed charge net hyper rapid charger took 32 minutes. This is slightly above average and it's reassuring as it looks like Subaru have finally sorted out those earlier slow charge issues. As for style, 5 out of 10. It's not ugly and it's not sexy, it's a pretty normal looking car. Is it fit for purpose though? Well yes and no, I'm giving it 7 spuds because while its range might mean an extra charging stop on a long distance trip, when it comes to scampering up hills it is the most agile all round EV that I've ever driven. But it's the all important 
PSC that matters and I can only offer the Solterra four spuds due to its lack of glove box as it refused to accept more than 42 starch bombs. Which gives a total spud score of 58. And there you have it, that's the spud score for the Subaru Solterra and I won't lie, when I first picked this car up I wasn't that impressed. It just seemed like a car that did everything okay but nothing remarkable. Then I took it off-roading and my perspective on this car has completely changed. I'm really impressed. I gotta say, hats off to you Subaru. This, this is a real Subaru.